um, for this final session, I'll try to give you an overview of the recent case law of the Court of Justice on an uh, environmental impact assessment. As I already indicated earlier, um, I didn't really fi find that many cases that uh, hit our, the topics of today and yesterday, so I tried to identify the recent cases that are of interest in this area, of broader interest. Um, and that's what you will see here in my outline. I will talk a little bit about access to justice. Uh, I will talk about the consequences of misapplication of the EIA directive, um, mainly the failure of doing an EIA at all. And if we still have time, I will talk a bit, little bit about the strategic environmental assessment. There we have the most developments in recent years. Um, after each of these sections, you will get a chance to ask questions, so it may be if the discussion about access to justice is really, really lively that we won't even get to any of the other sections. We will have to see. But first of all, some words about my, my some further words about my background to warn you. Um, I work for an advocate general. She's a member of the court. She advises the court by preparing opinions, but she doesn't participate in the deliberations. And of course, me as well, I don't participate in the deliberations. So everything that I tell you um, is not based on any specific insights about what the court really was thinking when they were writing a certain judgment. Um, I can only advise you to look at the opinions. They, in my opinion, they should be helpful to understand the case, to understand the options that were on the table, to understand a little bit more about the legal reasoning that was relevant to the case than if you only look at uh, the court judgment. But in the end, if you look for the authority of the court, you can only find it in the judgments, not in the opinion um, themselves. And of course, everything that I present to you is only my personal view, not even the view of my ad advocate general, of course. Okay, let's start with Leso Kranaske Soskupenje. Um, I just recently read that this case is, was even described by Advocate General Sharpson as Brown Bear II. Um, I can assure you no brown bears were harmed in the making of this case. There's no brown bear involved. The only idea that we get uh, with regard to the brown bear is that the first case brought by this NGO was about brown bears. This one is completely different. It, well, very, very different. It's about uh, an area that was fenced in to, to breed certain uh, certain species that were used for hunting, uh, and they wanted to extend this, and the whole thing took place in a bird protection area, and that's why Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive became relevant. Um, in effect, Leso Kranaskut Soskupenje tried to enforce the Habitats Directive and said that the appropriate assessment was not correctly done. Um, they brought an action, and uh, after two appeals to the Slovak Supreme Court, which sent the case down to the first instance court. Finally, the outcome seemed to be that they had introduced the wrong type of action. They could have introduced the correct type, type of action, but now they were out of time. They were time barred for this correct type of action, and it seemed to be that all avenues to get justice were closed by this time. But on this third appeal, the Slovak Supreme Court had some doubts in this regard and asked whether the right to effective judicial protection would allow this outcome. Um, if we want to apply the right to effective judicial protection as it is laid down in the Charter, of course, the right that needs that is to be enforced in such an action needs to be part of EU law. And it needs to be something that the NGO can rely on under EU law. And therefore, the question, the first question that needed to be resolved in this case was whether Article 6.3 is something that an NGO can invoke. Um, if you look at the Habitats Directive, you will not find any mention who can invoke Article 6.3 or any other provision of the Habitats Directive. Um, in the opinion, we developed two, two theses, two hypotheses, how an NGO could perhaps invoke Article 6.3. The first one is um, there's general case law uh, from the Court of Justice who can invoke directly effective 
provisions of EU law. And this case law says um, natural or legal persons directly concerned by an infringement of a directly applicable provision can, uh, must be able to complain to the courts. You may even find cases where the directly is missing, it's only sufficient that they are concerned. Um, but what is concerned? What is directly concerned? Does it mean you have to be a property owner and uh, to be harmed in your property, for example? The cases that we have is, are for, for about um, rules that are relevant for human health and people who live somewhere where their health might be affected by the measure in question of course, are concerned that EU law that protects them is correctly applied. Um, the Habitats Directive probably cannot be invoked to protect human health. It would be very difficult to, to find some such relationship. And of course, an NGO uh, doesn't have health concerns, at least not uh, human health concerns. How do we get there? Well. Um, uh, since we uh, transposed the Aarhus Convention into EU law by the, uh, the EIA directive and by other directives, we actually have a mechanism established in EU law how to recognize NGOs that uh, have as a, their purpose the protection of the environment. Uh, that's part of the EIA directive now. And uh, so there is a mechanism which recognizes that NGOs have a legitimate interest in protecting the environment. And once we have this, it's not that far a step to say, okay, if they have a legitimate interest to protect the environment, infringements of environmental law are of concern to them. They may even be of direct concern to them. And therefore we said, okay, environmental NGOs that have been recognized under the EIA mechanism uh, should be able to challenge before a court any decision that infringes uh, EU environmental law. Um, and then we had a second theory, which we developed much more broadly. In the, in the opinion, it took much more time. Um, and we also looked at the Aarhus Convention, and there we have a general provision on public participation in decisions, uh, which is Article 6.1b. 6.1a is more or less what the, about the projects that are part of the EIA Directive, or uh, and even Annex 1 of the EIA Directive. Uh, 6.1b covers all other projects that might have significant impacts on the environment. And uh, of course, uh, a project that requires an appropriate assessment under the Habitats Directive uh, could have a significant, significant impact on the environment simply by way of an impact on a protected site. Um, and therefore we said, okay, we think Article 6.1b of the Aarhus Convention should be considered to be directly applicable. Um, Therefore, they could directly rely on Article 6.1b and would have a right to participate in the procedure under this provision. And of course, this right could also be enforced. <coughs> the court uh, did it a little bit differently. They, there is some language in the judgment which follows a little bit our first theory, and there's other language which relies a little bit on our second theory. In the end, uh, the court, however, looked at Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive and does something that we, uh, we, we refuse to do. If you read Article 6.3 towards the end, you see uh, that the authorities must, if appropriate, obtain the opinion of the general public. Um, and the court reads this in conjunction with Article 6.1b of the Aarhus Convention and saying that, uh, okay, if we read this together, we always need participation of the public in uh, Article 6.3 uh, decisions. In our opinion, this didn't work because Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive is not sufficiently clear. It gives discretion to the authorities about the question whether it is appropriate or not. Only if you declare Article 6.1b of the House Convention to be directly effective, you will get public participation. But the court didn't go so far to say this. It just mixed these two provisions together and arrived on this specific reading of Article 6.3. Um, but once you have a right of public participation in, into uh, the appropriate assessment of article, under Article 6.3, of course, then uh, you have a right for an NGO here, which is part of the public concerned, 
to, to participate and then to defend uh, or to, to attack the decision. As I said, Leso Kranaskitsos Kupenje is part of the public concerned. There is a need for an appropriate assessment under Article 6.3, and therefore it may be possible to have that we have significant effects. Uh, and then we arrive at this right of the NGOs. Um, the court took another step as well. It threw the par uh, it, it mixed Article 9.2 of the AUS Convention into the, all of this. And of course, 9.2 is more or less the same of, as Article 11 of the EIA Directive. So um, the action is not actually limited to the participation rights here, but it covers everything, uh, all substantial and procedural issues that might affect the decision in question. It's much broader. Uh, the access to justice that we have here. And then we get got to the uh, real question of the case that we, we were asked by the Slovak court. Um, do we have effective judicial protection, protection here? Um, the opinion was quite open in this regard because we, we were not certain whether uh, the, the NGO uh, had ample opportunity to bring the correct action in time there were earlier cases by the Supreme Court, the first or the second uh, decision by the Supreme Court more, uh, more or less already indicated what would be the appropriate action, so they might have been able to do it. Um, or it could have been that they were in some way misled by the whole process and had uh, legitimate expectations. Or they, they were, uh, what they said during the hearing, they were quite sure that if they took the second action, then they would also have been stopped in some way. Um, and of course, is this, if this is the case, then uh, you cannot expect them to, to uh, exhaust all potential ways to court or only to be blocked again and again and again. Um, so we were not sure whether we had a uh, situation like in Kafka's story that somebody sits in front of the court and in the end when the person dies, the door that was prepared especially for them was closed, or whether we have Don Quixote who just runs against mill windmills uh, without taking the more appropriate action. The, for the court, the situation appeared to be more clear because they said, oh, it's so unclear what ha needs to be done under the Slovak system, therefore the barriers for the environmental NGOs are too high and uh, there was no effective judicial protec protection in this case. Um, th there are two points of general interest to take away from this case. First of all, um, now we have an obligatory public participation in, in the appropriate assessment under Article 6.3. Um, I'm pretty sure most of the appropriate assessments that had been done until then did not include public participation because nobody was, was aware of this obligation. So we, the court possibly created a number of problems for, for projects that were authorized without part, public participation. The second point is... Uh, of course, that environmental NGOs, which are recognized under the EIA directive, have standing to challenge the outcome of the appropriate assessment under Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive. What now is pending uh, is a case on the Water Framework Directive. Um, it's the, uh, there I'm called it WWF, but uh, we will get there with the next slide. Today, WWF. Uh, is gone. It was withdrawn by the Austrian courts due to development under Austrian jurisprudence. We only have the second case, 664 of 15, that's Protect Natur, Arten und Landschaftsschutz Umweltorganisation. Seems to be a much smaller NGO. Um, we now have an opinion of Advocate General Sharpson that I will present to you. We don't have a judgment yet. It's about a permit to abstract water from a nearby river for a snowmaking facility at a ski resort. And uh, PROTECT wanted to participate in the administrative procedure for this permit. Why did they want to do this? Because only, under Austrian law, only parties that participate, that are parties to the administrative procedure are allowed subsequently to challenge the decision in court. But already at the stage of the administrative procedure, they were rejected uh, because the Austrian authorities didn't find any rights that PROTECT could claim under Austrian water law. Um, 
And now they went to court, and the court asked us whether they enjoy rights under Article 4 of the Water Framework Directive um, that give it access to justice under Article 9.3 of Aarhus. If we look at Sharpson's opinion, first of all, she clarifies that, uh, according to the reference, um, Article 6 and 9.2 of Aarhus, the public participation provisions are not applicable in this case and also the provisions of the EIA directive or the, of the Habitats directive are not at issue here. Um, so the court really, the Austrian court really asks the Luxembourg court to look at Article 4 of the Water Framework Directive, more precisely Article 4.1a of the Water Framework Directive, the prohibition of deterioration. There we have some case law already, and uh, from this case law we can see it is binding, it has direct effect. Um, but it doesn't say, this jurisprudence doesn't say anything whether NGOs can invoke this provision. Um, Sharpston also recognizes that member states enjoy discretion in implementing Article 9.3 of Aarhus. Um, she also recognizes, of course, that in the first Lizukanaske case, the court said Article 9.3 is not directly effective. Um, and then she goes back to one of the earlier cases on Aarhus, namely uh, the conditions for the recognition of environmental NGOs that were part of the Jurgarden case from Sweden. Um, and there the court, following her opinion, says, said that uh, member states may not exclude all environmental NGOs under the guise of national law criteria. Um, and of course that's a very, really brilliant stroke of her referring to this because there we also are an area where member states in principle enjoy discretion um, and where it was quite evident, obvious to everybody that if a member state like Sweden limited uh, the criteria so far that only one NGO, I think in the end only WWF Sweden was big enough to fulfill all the criteria set by Sweden, uh, that was quite clearly not a uh, 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 faithful transposition of uh, this provision on recognition of NGOs. and there the court already had limited discretion of member states. So why not do it with regard to Article 9.3 of, of Aarhus? And of course, uh, the way to do it is to check whether there is really anybody left standing, well, whether anybody left who has legal standing <laughs> uh, after we apply the Austrian criteria. And, uh, it seems quite clear under Austrian law there, is, there aren't any NGOs that could claim any rights with regard uh, to Article 4 of the Water Framework Directive. Nobody seems to be able to, to invoke a provision that aims to protect the environment uh, or public interest such as the provisions of Article 4 of the Water Framework Directive. Um, so it's quite clear that Austrian used their discretion to exclude access to justice in this, these cases. And um, then, if we see it like this, uh, one way to limit this discretion would obviously be to, to, rec to, to recognize that environmental NGOs that we've already recognized as have, having a legitimate interest in protecting the environment, that they are the natural guardians who should at least be able to go to court about uh, such a case. Um, Chapson also says that effective judicial protection under Article 47 of the Charter would be undermined if environmental NGOs could not enforce EU environmental law. Of course, this already assumes that environmental NGOs enjoy rights from EU environmental law. Um, if you remember the opinion on Les Ukrainas that's what we had also said uh, that they do. Um, Charpston arrives at a similar result by a different reasoning, and we will have to see whether the court now takes up this reasoning and uh, adopts a broader approach than in Leso Kanaskis Tsoskupenje and doesn't limit it to one provision of uh, EU environmental law. Obviously, if the court accepts standing of NGOs and with regard to Article 4 of the Water Framework Directive, then we are much closer to a general approach. It would be much more difficult to, to limit uh, standing to Article 4 because there are no things like 
public participation uh, where you could make the link in Article 4 of the Water Framework Directive. This morning I checked whether there was already a date for the judgment in our uh, calendar and I didn't see it, so I can't really tell you a date about uh, where, when we get the judgment, but I'm pretty sure we will get it very soon. Okay, next case. There we will get the judgment a little bit later, I think. Um, that's, uh, I tend to call it the pylon case. Uh, Again, we only have an opinion. This is uh, another case about costs of justice and limitation of costs. Um, you will remember that under the Aarhus Convention, uh, the cost of procedures should not be prohibitively expensive, and the, this rule is all, has also been put into the EIA Directive. Here, in this case, we had a dispute about a power line project in Ireland. Um, this didn't go anywhere. The Irish court uh, considered the action to be premature, and now they have to decide on the costs. It also appears that at least some of the action was based on the IA directive, but other elements seem to concern purely national law. And uh, what I was hoping when I saw this case, uh, that we might get uh, some clarification what substantive or procedural legality under Article 11.1 of the EIA Directive means. You remember there's this clause in there, and if you look at our jurisprudence on it, you will see that the court has always said EU environmental law is covered, um, but it, they don't say anything about national environmental law. Of course, if you look at the wording, substantive or procedural legality seems to cover everything, including national environmental law. Um, but on the other hand, you would get probably get into problems with regard to competence if you assumed that an EU act like the EIA directive would suddenly create access to justice about the infringement of national environmental law, which has no link to EU environmental law. So it's problematic, it's difficult. And Bobek really found an interesting way to get around it without addressing it, really. Um, and after reading his opinion, I'm convinced that that's the way to do it. Uh, he, sa he focuses on the purpose of the rule on limited costs, and the purpose, of course, is wide access to justice. People should not be deterred by cost risks, and uncertainty of cost risks is already a barrier to access. Um, so, first of all, he makes clear that uh, the Irish action of application for leave to bring an action is already covered um, with regard to these, this issue of premature actions. He says, of course, uh, if it's not clear when an action needs to be brought, then premature actions also need to be covered. Um, on the other hand, if it was clear that the action was premature to everybody involved, then that would probably be a case of abuse, and then you could, of course, put costs on the abuser. Um, and then we get to the interesting bit about whether all challenges are covered. And of course, the EIA is covered. EU environmental law is covered. There we have jurisprudence. What about national law? Here, he argues from the purpose and says, if we made this, dis this distinction between national law and EU environmental law, we would create uncertainty, huge uncertainty, because just put yourself in, in the shoes of a plaintiff who going to court, you will probably not really know what part of your action uh, will, in the end, create the most work, create the most costs. It depends on the defense of the other party where they focus. They may even bring some defense which you didn't even mention in your action. Uh, he, uh, Bobek brought the example, what if they say that, that they uh, uh, contest your property claims that are at issue here. Property is purely a national matter, and then uh, the whole dispute is about the property to the plot of land that you're basing your claim on, um, and not at all about EU environmental law. Uh, does this mean uh, this is national law and you should bear the cost of all this dispute? You would have a huge deterrence. And therefore, he suggests that we should, with regard to costs, not look at the distinction between national law but, and EU law, but take the whole action and, and treat it uh, the same way. And I find this very, very reasonable. 
Um, of course, if somebody abuses this process by just putting in some EIA claim in there, even if there's no link to the EIA, that would be an abuse and could be sanctioned. But in general, if there's a good faith case being brought to court, uh, then you should have cost protection for all of the action. Again, we will have to wait what the court will make out of it. Um, okay, now we get to the directive that is a topic of this uh, seminar, uh, the EIA directive, and there were two cases recently which dealt with the consequences of misapplication of the EIA directive. Uh, in these cases, there was a complete absence of an environmental impact assessment. Um, and we will have, still have to wait to see what happens if there, were, or there are only small mistakes, but I think the second case will already give us some indication how this might be resolved. The first one is Stadt Wiener Neustadt. It's from Austria again. A waste treatment plant at uh, the city of Stadt Wiener Neustadt has been operating for many years, but when they authorized it, they didn't do an EIA because Austrian law on the EIA was quite restrictive in the past. Um, now it seems to be clear that if today such a permit was issued, they would do an EIA. Uh, and the town no longer is really, apparently is really happy with this waste treatment plant and wanted to have a finding that there should actually have been an EIA. It's not clear what, what the effect of such a finding should have been, what they expected from it, but they asked for such a finding. And uh, they were refused because Austrian law provides that uh, if a permit has not been challenged after three years, it is deemed to comply with the EIA legislation. Um, and the question that then the Austrian courts put to us was, is this permissible under the EIA directive? The court put this, framed this question by asking about Article 1, Paragraph 5 of the directive. There's this exemption for legislative permits. Uh, if, legis if some parliament says this project is authorized, then in principle the AA directive is not applicable. However, we have jurisprudence on this which says then the objectives of the EIA, di EIA directive need to be <coughs> complied with in the legislative procedure. That means you will have to have something like an EIA, uh, envir an env environmental impact assessment in the legislative process the public at least needs to be informed. And of course, if you have a general provision which exempts all kinds of pro projects, you cannot comply with this, re these requirements because the legislator doesn't know which project would later on profit from this rule. So this went nowhere. But we went further and uh, looked at general principles of uh, law of, of the EIA. Um, and uh, there we find that uh, there are cases where EU law allows it to regular, regularize unlawful measures. But the court has said there should be no opportunity to circumvent EU law, and of course such regularization uh, should remain the exceptions, the exception. Um, and the court also has recognized that reasonable Time limits for, for legal challenges are also allowed, but uh, illegal permits may not simply be assumed to be lawful. Uh, that's more or less what the court then also said with regard to this case here. In principle, it is possible for us to, to do, develop some way to regularize such uh, projects, but uh, it should not go too far and it may not simply be assumed that everything is in order. And then the court also uh, reminded everybody that there is all the jurisprudence, that if there is another permit issued with regard to this project, then in the, uh, this other permit procedure also the earlier project needs in some way to be assessed, and there may of course be a right to get damages uh, because of this infringement. The result of all of this is that these cases are in some way uh, tainted. The, the permit is not, uh, has not the same value as a permit issued after the EIA directive. But uh, apart from this obligation to perhaps do an EIA later on and perhaps pay damages, there's 
there are no other legal consequences yet described. There may be some situations where we get uh, other legal consequences, but they have not been explored yet, so we don't really know what, what are the consequences. Um, the second case is Commune di Corridonia, uh, which gives us some clarification how regularization, regularization might actually work. Um, these were biogas installation. They were authorized without an EIA or even an EIA screening because there were thresholds in regional legislation. And then they were, of course, built and they were started to operate. In the interim, the Italian Constitutional Court had annulled these uh, thresholds. Um, and then the pending legal challenges against these installations succeeded. Uh, they were closed and uh, the new, perm new permit procedures were started. There were even EIAs for these installations, and then they received new permits. What is perhaps also an important uh, background information to this case, uh, these, these uh, local authorities had asked for interim measures to prevent the building and the authorization, or the, at least the use of the permit, and uh, the Italian courts has, ha had rejected interim measures. Um, that demonstrates the important of it, importance of interim measures because many of the problems that we had in these cases could have been resolved if they had had interim relief and waited for the decision on the substance. But we didn't get it. We got the installations instead. And now we had EIAs that were conducted after the installation had already been built. And, uh, of course, plaintiffs again go to court and complain that such an EIA is inadmissible under the directive. Well, if you look at the directive, it's quite clear they are correct. The EIA must be conducted before the permit is, is issued and, prior, of course, prior to the realization uh, of the project. And uh, Hendrik has already mentioned the difficulties that might be involved if you have to do an EIA afterwards. Uh, the baseline is no longer clear. You don't know what was on, at this location before the project was built. Um, if there's discretion involved in the authorization of the project, um, of course, it's difficult to imagine that this discretion will then be exercised in a different way after uh, this ex post EIA has been done. Um, well, many, many, many problems. Um, on the other hand, we have case law, the Wells case, for example, that member state must uh, nullify uh, the unlawful consequences of a failure to conduct an EIA. Um, so they must try to carry out the uh, assessment, must compensate harm resu resulting from breach. Um, and then we have case law on the regularization of unlawful measures. Of course, no circumvention, and they should remain the exception. Um, and that means, in such a case, uh, of course, the later assessment, even if it cannot be as effective as the earlier assessment, is indispensable. And of course, there are, while, while there are things which the later assessment cannot do as well as the earlier assessment, other things are probably much better because now the environmental impacts resulting from the operation of uh, the installation can be much better assessed. You now have new data. You don't have to do a model. You can look at the actual impacts. Um, so uh, this uh, is something that, that in any event should be done. Ah, so. But, uh, of course, if you look uh, at the uh, opinion in this case, you will find out some slight dis distinction between the judgment and the opinion. The opinion, uh, again, took a little bit the same approach as in the Stadt Wiener Neustadt case. Uh, in our opinion, the uh, permit was tainted because they didn't have the prior ERA that was required by the ERA directive. There is even case law that supported this uh, approach because in the Krizan case, which was on, on uh, IPPC and uh, um, the prevention and uh, no, I don't get the name together, but it was on industrial installations, the authorization of industrial installations. Uh, there the court, there's a very similar system to the EIA directive and there the court said um, 
such regularization only is possible if uh, the, the, the public is put in the same position as if uh, there had initially been an EIA with public participation. That means that if the public participation cannot be have the same effects later on, then regularization is excluded. You don't have the full effect of saying, okay, this permit is now equivalent to a permit issued after an EIA. Um, of, of course, difficulty with this approach is that we don't really know what are the consequences later on for such a tainted permit. It's not that you need to annul the permit, but it's also not sure that there won't be negative consequences down the road. And the court preferred clarity. They said, okay, this here is a case of regularization. Um, there's no circumvention uh, evident, and it remains the exception. Only these projects are affected. Therefore, it's possible to do it. And if I understand the court correctly, um, this permit that they have now is more or less equivalent to the one that they would have gotten if they had initially done an EIA. Uh, of course, we don't know what, how this judgment then is understood later on. It may be understood by some as an invitation to circumvent the EIA. Um, we'll have to see. Okay, now we get to the strategic environmental assessment. There we had quite a number of cases recently. Um, this is perhaps the most important, Dultremont, and it's also quite contested currently in court. Um, the uh, Belgian government uh, has asked us to reconsider it. Um, and this is again is another Belgian case. Uh, the Walloon region, in this case, adopted re a regulatory measure fixing certain technical requirements for wind farms in the region. And the question arose, is this a plan or project, a program under this Directive on Strategic Environmental Assessment. Um, there even is a definition of plans or programs in the directive, but it is not really helpful. Um, it says who adopts these measures, and uh, it says that they must be required by legislative, regulatory, or, or administrative provisions. When we started with this directive, I thought this would be a strict, strong limitation to the scope of the directive because not many measures are really required by legislation. Um, but then we got the case you see here where the court said, oh, um, this actually means, uh, that doesn't mean that these plans, uh, these measures must be adopted. It, uh, it only means that they are regulated by legislative regulatory or administrative provisions. And this covers more or less everything that not only the administration but perhaps also the legislator does because uh, anything that public authorities do has in some way, is in some way regulated. Uh, so it is extremely broad, this approach. Um, and that's part of the problem that uh, now uh, that is now brought to us in the consequence of Doltremont. In Doltremont, we looked at the measure in question. We saw it applies to all of the balloon region. The qu one of the question here was whether this is really a sufficiently defined area. If you think of plans, you might be thinking of very much more limited areas where something is planned. But on the other hand, if you think of programs, uh, it would not be at all surprising to have a program that applies to the whole territory of a region or even a member state. And if you look at the first case on uh, the strategic environmental assessment, it was about programs for uh, nitrates in agriculture, and quite often these programs are for the whole member state. So territory is not a uh, kick-out condition. Um, does it set a, a, a sufficient framework for a project? That was also one of the hypotheses brought to us in the Dultremont case. And uh, here, we could rely on an earlier case on uh, the Akolos River and Crease. And there the court, in one of the many questions, quite on the sides, pulled out some kind of definition uh, and said, said uh, plans or programs are measures which establish by defining rules and procedures for scrutiny applicable to the sector concerned, criteria and detailed rules for the grant of 
implementation and implementation of one or more projects likely to have significant effects on the environment, which is uh, already quite broad. And here in our case, um, the court limited or, or, or specified this definition by adding it needs to be a significant body of criteria and detailed rules. Obviously, this is some way of creating a de minimis rule, uh, excluding measures which only set tiny little parts of a framework for, for projects. Um, on the other hand, one paragraph earlier, the court says we must be careful to prevent uh, the salami tactic, cutting the framework into little bits and avoiding the strategic environmental assessment this way. So um, one of the issues that we're now dealing with is what is a significant body. Um, and of course, already in Dultremont, there was lots of debate about the distinction from general rules because if you remember, uh, measures regulated by uh, legislation that would include all general legislation probably. Um, and here the parties relied on the AUS Convention and the Kiev, Kiev Protocol which distinguishes between uh, plans or programs and more general measures. Uh, the solution to that for the court was uh, that uh, as Article 2A, this definition explicitly covers legislative measures, um, it's broader than uh, the convention and the protocol. And it doesn't have any rules like the convention or the protocol on more general measures. Um, so uh, from this perspective, it seems as if the more general measures are also included in the definition of plans or programs. And that's part of the problem which motivates the Belgian government and I think the Danish government also, who were also in court recently, uh, to argue against this definition. Of course, my idea would be uh, the point where you have to intervene is not this de definition, but um, the earlier one required by legislative regulatory or administrative provisions. Um, there we even have a case from the UK Supreme Court where they said, we, they, we don't believe that this is the proper interpretation and if it was relevant for us, we would make a reference. And, uh, but it seems up to now, they never had a case where it became relevant to them, so we never were again confronted with this uh, issue and with their criticism. But uh, I think uh, that's something that the court really should think about again in a proper case where this is raised by the national court so that everybody uh, can prepare and debate this issue. Well, okay, so much for this. Uh, the thing that we should take away from Doltremont is now we have this definition of plans or programs developed by jurisprudence. And we will have to see whether it is really helpful in future to resolve these issues and perhaps whether it is helpful to enable national courts to do away with references whether this measure or that measure is a plan or program. Um, one thing that uh, helps to, to, one case that helps to deal with some of the legal uncertainty resulting from the jurisprudence that is laid down in Dultremont and, and in the other case is this case, Association France Nature, Association France Nature en Environnement. Um, in French legislation, there was a huge problem. Um, you will remember in the SEA directive, there's a re requirement that uh, the authority adopting the measure should be independent or the, the authority conducting the SEA should be independent from the authority adopting the measure. Um, and obviously, conflict of interest is to be avoided. Then there was jurisprudence from our court which insisted this is important, that this must be guaranteed. And uh, for some plans or programs in France, this was not sufficiently guaranteed. And that meant uh, that all these plans or programs that were adopted uh, under this insufficient rule, that they suffered a deficiency. They could be annulled. Uh, in, on a, uh, uh, so they could be annulled and that would mean that many plans or programs would si simply disappear and the measures adopted on the basis of this plan or program or the measures, uh, the, the permits that were limited by this plans or program uh, would suddenly no longer have these limits. 
that could create lots of problems for the environment. Therefore, uh, the Council of State asks us whether already when they deal with this breach on the level of the legislation, um, they could uh, say uh, we maintain it, we maintain this rule in place until it has been repaired in order to avoid having lots of plans and programs uh, with a deficiency. Um, and uh, well, in asking this uh, question, they could rely on an earlier case. Uh, in principle, the primacy of EU law does not allow the continued application of infringing national provisions. Um, however, in Inter Environnement Wallonie and Terre Wallonne, another Belgian case, uh, the court said, okay, there may be instances where it is justified to maintain in place plans or programs which were adopted with this deficiency um, exactly because abolishing them without replacement would be worse for the environment than maintaining them. Um, however, the, the bit to remember about this case is it was about the nitrates directive and about the programs adopted under the nitrates directive. Um, and the court strictly limited this exception to the nitrates directive. Uh, you see it in the first two conditions, the nitrates directive is uh, explicitly mentioned. Mm. And of course, the maintenance of such measures must not be longer than really needed. Um, member states must try to replace them as soon as possible. Um, but what do we do with regard to the French case, looking at this? Well, um, there's a parallel to Stadt Wiener Neustadt. Again, uh, here a court asks us uh, to, to, to maintain general legislation, but if you look at Anton Vormont Wallonie, that was always looking at specific plans or programs. And that's what national courts need to do here as well. You can't just authorize uh, to the maintenance of uh, legislation which infringes EU law. You will have to look into each individual plan or program whether they can be maintained. Um, the court also addressed the issue of limitation to the nitrates directive and said this only resulted from the circumstances of the court uh, the case and, and uh, but overriding considerations to protect it, uh, con consideration linked to the protection of the environment uh, are always valid, which is also a very reason reasonable thing to do. And if you look at the opinion on the earlier in Erta and Vormont case, you will see the opinion already said something along these lines, but the court obviously uh, saw it, saw the necessity to limit it to the Dietrich's Directive in the earlier case. And in this case here now, um, the court said, okay, we give up on this limitation. If you he look at the opinion in this case, you will see that we were a little bit more reticent, more reluctant to accept this because this case was decided by a chamber of five and the earlier case was a grand chamber case. Um, but apparently nobody seemed to be worried about this problem and the court just took the further step here. Um, this is also relevant for an additional question that the French Council of State brought to us. They asked whether the courts would always be required to consult our court when maintaining provisions or plans or programs in this case. Um, here the court repeated our jurisprudence on the obligation to bring, to make reference for last instance courts and uh, they said you have to be particularly careful here because you're main, uh, going to maintain a measure which at least procedurally infringes EU law. Um, but if there's no reasonable doubt as to the outcome, then you don't have to ask a question to our court. Um, in, our, in the opinion, you will see that we believe that the limitations set by the inter environment Wallonie case uh, had as a consequence that for each new plan or program, at least for each new type of plan or program that you want to maintain, you will have to make a new reference. Um, well, this has been avoided by the approach of the court. 
Obviously, this may be abused in certain cases, but on the other hand, abuse can never be completely prevented. So probably the court uh, saved us some work that we would have gotten if we had received questions on all types of plans or programs. And uh, we'll have to see how this plays out in practice. And I think this may be the final case for today, Associazione Italia Nostra Onlus. This was a case that raised issues about an exemption for local plans or programs, of local plans or programs of a small scale. Um, a dispute was about a housing development on an island in the Venetian Lagoon. The area is right next to a site of community interest and a bird site, um, but the planning measure was not subject to a strategic environmental assessment. The authorities relied on the exemption for plans and programs determining the use of small areas at local level. Um, and the Italian court now asks us questions about the validity of Article 3.3, this exemption. And if the provision is valid, it asks for an interpretation. You will not be surprised. Uh, the court did not find that this provision was invalid. Um, of course, EU environmental law should aim at a high level of protection. But this high level of protection will only be preached uh, in case of manifest errors. And a manifest error was not to be found here, in particular because if you look at Article 3.3, um, you cannot just exempt all types of plans or programs at a local level uh, from uh, the strategic assessment. You will always have to do at least a screening whether there could be significant effects and if it is the plan or program is likely to have significant effects, then of course you need to do, still do the strategic environmental assessment. And then, of course, we had to look further into the interpretation of this provision. Um, and we said, uh, well, we and the court said two things. Um, first of all, on the local level, that means that uh, the measure must be adopted by the local authority measures adopted by national or regional authorities will not be covered. Um, and as with regards to the small area, uh, you will have to look at the quantitative relation uh, to the area of the local, where the author local authority is competent. Um, of course, in, in a case like Venetia, the city of Venice uh, probably has a very large area, and in our case, it would probably be a small area because it's compared to Venice, it's really a small bit of land that is concerned. Okay, and I think that's all for now. <laughs> I thank you for your attention.